Alright guys, uh, welcome back to another episode. This time I got um, what a lot of people describe as kind of like a legend, as someone who has been doing this for a long time, people look up to, I know I certainly do, uh, Kyle Mills. How are you doing, Kyle? I'm doing well, thanks. So, um, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, I know you got a busy schedule. You're about to go on kind of the book tour for Code Red. Um, you're going to be on there with Don Bentley, which I think is really cool. Uh, and we'll get into kind of that relationship later. But uh, what I want to start off with is kind of reflecting on the Vince uh, Flynn legacy and kind of what it meant to you and what your journey has been like writing the books leading up to Code Red. Uh, but first, like, what did what did that first, like, phone call feel like to you when you got the call and they're like, hey, we want you to take over for him after his passing? What was that like for you? Yeah, it was really strange because, you know, I had uh, I was working one day and my wife actually called me from work where she had heard that Vince had died and, you know, he was really young. Um, and I mean, it's really a blow to the whole writing community and, and the thriller community. But I remember a little later kind of selfishly thinking that, you know, what's going to happen to the series. Cause I'd been a big fan yeah. of the series. And then the last man had just kind of left off. Like the story wasn't even done. And, um, I was thought, I, I wonder if there, if he had finished it, maybe like if, if the, if the book was in existence to, sure. to follow up or if they'd maybe hire somebody to finish it. Here we are again. Here we are again. So, uh, we got you back. So let's, we were talking about Vince Flynn's legacy and kind of what happened when you heard about his death and the last man and if the book was finished. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah. And, and I, you know, didn't really think about it too much after that. I was interested to see what would happen. And then I got a call asking me if I might be interested in finishing that, that storyline and continuing on the series. So Honestly, I wasn't sure. I mean, I hadn't really thought about it in the sense of me doing it. You know, I'd always read those books as a fan, not, you know, with the idea of could I do this or, you know, how did he put together his stories? You know, it's just, you know, fun to read. Right. Um, so, yeah, I said, well, you know, I'm not sure. And I went back and grabbed my copy of The Last Man and read it again and tried to think, you know, where would I go with it? And, you know, could I, because Vince and I, had a different writing style, like really different. And uh, could I do it? You know, could I write, for instance, really long action sequences, which I'd never done much of in my life. So, but then I thought, yeah, I think I could do a pretty credible job of it. Um, and they wanted to know what I was going to do. And I said, well, probably something like this, but I doubt it'll really turn out that way. Because, you know, it's always funny, you know, you, you come up with an idea and then you put it down on the page and it looks like crap. You know, it's, it's not, you know, the, your ideas that seem good in your mind sometimes don't look so good on the page. So mm -hmm. I thought they probably wouldn't hire me since I basically told them I had no idea what I was going to write about, but they did. And, uh, yeah, it turned out well. I mean, it was really stressful because I had no idea at that point whether people would want it continued, whether they want me, somebody else to write the character, whether they'd hate the, what I did with it. And all that so it but it turned out they that people did want it continued they wanted to see his legacy continued and uh they liked the book so uh it all, all it worked out uh it worked out well i think for fans what was the support like from like the fans and the fellow authors when you were announced to kind of continue it on yeah it was really great because i remember the announcement coming out and and thinking, well, you know, let the hate mail begin. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, it was the opposite. You That's know, awesome. people were basically just like, you know, we were so sad to see Vince go and we don't want the character to go with him. We want to see his legacy. And people write these long letters about, you know, what he meant to them, what these books meant to them, what the character meant to them, you know. Yeah. And um, yeah, it was great. I mean, the underlying current was, you know, now don't screw it up which was <laughs> a little, a, a little nerve wracking, but yeah. um, people really with very, very few exceptions, people, you know, loved, you know, well, that character and they wanted to see the character 
carry on, at least to some sort of closure. I was talking to Mike Madden a couple of weeks ago, and Mike Madden has done the Clancy series as well as his own series. Now he's in Clive Cussler's series, and I, I asked him kind of the same thing, like, what was it like when you got the call to you know, do the Clancy stuff? And he kind of told me a backstory about some things I didn't know leading up to that. And then he was like, so I was really surprised. But he was like, they said, here's the Clancy world. Go in and do your thing. Don't break it. And I was like, that is like the ultimate, like, line don't cross. But, like, it's a huge thing. Like, if you break the Clancy world, people are going to come at you. And yeah. I was like, Mike, that's a, that was huge for them to tell you. He's like, yeah, go play in the playground with all the Clancy things. Just do not break anything. Well, and the Clancy stuff would be hard, at least. Yeah. You know, at least I've got one series. Yeah. You know, at the time, I think there were 14 books. Mm -hmm. And... You know, very linear, whereas the Clancy series has so many tentacles and yeah. it's been going on. I mean, I remember I met Tom when I first met Tom Clancy. I was in college, like a freshman in college. Oh, wow. Yeah. So he was so, Mike Madden. He was, he's been around for a while. He told me some funny stories behind that. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. Because, I mean, that's the that's John Clark and Ryan Sr., Ryan Jr. And there's a lot of people yeah. you could play with there. But take it easy and don't break it. <laughs> yeah. Too many really. Like it's, yeah. it's, it would be really overwhelming. I admire people that can, that can get into that universe. Right. So what does, now that you've been in the Flynn series with Mitch Rapp, uh, what does, what does the series mean to you now compared to when maybe you first started and you were just more of a fan? Yeah, it's really interesting to get one of your favorite characters and have people say, you know, go to town with it. Um, it's it's an interesting journey, you know, um, and Mitch has been on a, a journey since I picked him up because, you know, characters have to change and grow and and things. And he was really angry and frustrated when I picked him up. And I thought, you know, this is like kind of unsustainable. He's like so his life was so horrible. Mm -hmm. um, and so through my time, uh, you know, the world has changed a lot yeah. since Vince died. And, you know, Mitch has changed a lot since, since Vince died. So I think to me, it's given me a whole new perspective kind of on the character to sort of inhabit that character every day. And this happens to him. How does he feel about it? What's he going to do about it? You know, he's getting older you know, all of these things. So, I, you know, it's really different. Like being a fan is, I think one of the components is the time. Like you you burn through a book and like, I, yeah, you've always burned through one of uh, Vince's books in a few days, right? And and then that's how much time you spend with Mitch Rapp every year. But I spend yeah. every day, yeah. you know, with Mitch and Scott and, you know, everybody. So it's... um that's the world I live in, you know, eight hours a day now. I remember when I first got back into reading fiction uh, years ago, um, right when I was getting out of the military, and, um, you know, you grab a hold of a character, you burn through a book in a couple of days, and then you look up the author, like, oh, when's the next one coming out? It's like nine months from now. And you're like, well, can't these guys pump these things out a little faster? Like, come on, man, I need, I need some more, but that's part of the tease. But... Um, I ask every author this that I have on, um, what is kind of like your preparation for writing a book? Like, you know, do you do, you do a long outline? Do you take three to six months? Kind of like what is Kyle Mills process to gearing up to that? Yeah. So I write really long outlines. I probably, really. I probably write the longest outlines in the, <laughs> in the business. Um, and so, I have a pretty well-formed idea when I actually start writing chapters, of what's going to happen in every chapter, what the characters are like, how they're going to arc over the, over the thing. So I don't think that's very common though. Like most, I don't think most authors do that. They have a general idea of where they're going to go with it and then sort of let it flow. I think a lot of them feel like their creativity would be stifled if they had a long outline. And the weird thing about my outlines is I spent a ton of time working on them, but I don't necessarily follow them. Okay. But, but because I've worked so long and that I really understand the story, the characters, what's going to happen, 
but maybe I'm writing a chapter and it just turns out different or a character does something I don't expect them to do, you know, which happens a lot. So, um, yeah, I like to do the really long outlines. It takes me about a year to write a book. I think a lot of writers now are much faster. Mm -hmm. When I started out, everybody wrote a book a year and the weirdo was, uh, was Stephen King. Like nobody could even understand that guy. They're like yeah. eh, coming out with like three books a year or something. And, but all the rest of us pretty much did one book a year. Now it's pretty common to do two, potentially three, which oh, uh, I could do. Andrews and Wilson on the other day. And I was like, so what's coming on next guys? And they're like, oh, well, we got this releasing and this releasing and this releasing and this releasing. And I was like, I mean, just they're, they're a machine. Just, I mean, it's, I know it's the two of them, but still like. Their ability to work uh, as a team and crank it out is amazing. Yeah, it's it's really I don't I honestly don't understand. I someday I should sit with Don or you know Mark Rainey or somebody and say, okay, let me show me how to do this. Like, what do you do all day? I'm just going to stand here in a corner and watch like how you get this much work done in a day because I can't do it. Don so, really told me something about um, he does like a ten or fifteen minute writing session. And he'll take like thirty to forty five minutes off. And then he'll come back and he'll do that for like hours. And that's how he just stays focused. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah, sometimes I just have to do that. I just, I can't sit down for five hours and write. I'll do 10, 15 minute bursts, walk away, come back. And that's just my day. And I was like, wow, that's impressive. Yeah. Everybody has a different like system. A lot of people are very interested in what your process is, but it's funny to talk to people. You know, I, I have a friend who, who, for instance, writes one page a day and he makes it perfect. So it's that one page and he edits it, and goes over it, and that page is perfect. And then once his, when his book's done, it's completely done. He doesn't have to go back and even correct the spelling. It's just done, off it goes. I could never do that because I'd end up throwing a bunch away, a bunch of work away because I'd, you know, constantly I'm like, ah, oh, you know, this doesn't work. You know, I'm a chapter 10 and I, what I'm doing in chapter 10 makes it even with the outline makes chapter four, not work or mm -hmm. whatever, you know, or, or I write an entire chapter and say, you know, God, that was just like, blah, blah, blah. It accomplished nothing. <laughs> yeah. I just throw it away. So when I do a second draft, I'll typically cut 20,000 words out of the book. Wow. So I'll write like 120,000 word first draft and it'll typically come in around a hundred. Cause it's just fly. My first job is just really flabby. Just a lot of like words that don't need to be there. And I, I like really tight books that kind of, yeah. You know, do you find it easier to cut or add? Oh, cut. I, I struggle with writing a really long book. I wrote a 135,000 word book once called sphere of influence. And, uh, it's by far the longest book I ever wrote. Um, so, cause I'm always looking to cut like something that's not necessary or yeah. somebody once asked me, you know, do you use myriad or a myriad of I'm like, Oh, myriad, because it's one word instead of three, you know, like anytime I can cut a word out cause it's not necessary. I love doing that. Like what's the essence of that character? How can you capture, you know, an entire character in one word? It's impossible, but you know, you want as few as possible, or at least that's my philosophy. I don't think it's a lot of people's philosophy and it wasn't Vince's. I mean, if you read his books, there are a lot of, you know, kind of tangents and subplots and, mm -hmm. you know, stories about characters that maybe aren't primary characters or who are going to die soon. And I mean, it didn't make the books any less enjoyable, sure. but just a different style. Yeah. Well, and Clancy wrote notoriously long books. He would go into painstaking detail about, you know, a weapon system or or what the character oh, yeah. was doing at the time, you know, and and it, you know, for hardcore fans, you know, that that was awesome, you know, le legacy Clancy fans, that's awesome. It's not necessarily the case now, but I think that's a lot of that has changed because of social media and the internet and attention spans have changed. So books are shorter now. Books yeah. are shorter now. I don't think Mark yeah. Greeny has gotten that memo because he still cranks out almost 500 pages. But um, that's true. His yeah. last book I just, I've read of just a while ago, and yeah, it was pretty long. The um, I think it's a uh, yeah. It's funny. My first contract, it's been like the early 90s or something, uh, stated 
a novel of like 125,000 words, around 125,000 words. And now they're, it's as much shorter. It's like 100 or 95,000 words yeah. or something typically. <laughs> it's just a really different, uh, just, uh, just the readers just have a little bit of a different uh, expectation. Yeah. So talking about expectations, as you've been writing Mitch Rapp, um, have fans' expectations kind of changed? Have you gotten that feedback from them on like what they expect Mitch to do next uh, compared to some of your ideas for the future? Like, How did that go along the journey? I don't think so. Not, not for the plots and stuff. Some people, like his personal life and things, um, you know, said they didn't see it going this way or they li really liked where his personal life was going and things like that. So, no, I don't think, I think that people expect in a Mitch Rapp novel, you know, people expect obviously, you know, a good guy and a bad guy and the bad guy's going to get theirs in the end, you know, the satisfying arc of that. And that it really be, I think it's really important that those books be really focused on the character, on Mitch. So, um, you know, people are really, that's why people read these books. They're really passionate about that character. They want to see what that character is doing, you know, when they visit him once a year. And um, I think those are the big expectations that, you know, you have an action-packed book in which, you know, there's something big at stake and that, you know, Mitch is sort of the focus of that. That wasn't necessarily true in Vince's books. Mm -hmm. You know, he wrote books that, you know, Mitch wasn't really in that much. Um, but it's funny how, and I did it, I do it too, you know, I, that you look back on a series and you, you have in your mind what that series was, but because I studied that series and took a ton of notes on that series, I know what it really is. Yeah. And so for, for instance, people think that Vince never swore, you know, that there was no swearing in his books, which I can tell you is yeah. absolutely not true. No. So people <laughs> ride me all the time. They're like, Oh, you see all this swearing and you drop the F bomb like a ton. And I actually have uh, these, all, the, all of Vince's books off his word processor so I can search them. So I know like how many times the F bomb was dropped in every single book. And I'm like, in fact, <laughs> actually, <laughs> Vince did it. In fact, there's one book where he did it four times on one page. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, so, or, you know, that the, the, all the books were really, really centered on Mitch or that all the books, in other words, everybody thinks all the books fire up with action, that there's some massive action sequence right at the beginning of those books. That would be extremely rare in a Vince Flynn novel. Yeah. Um, you know, some of them go hundred pages, with no action mm -hmm. in them, but people think it's that way. So, you know, if I write three pages with no yeah, action, they're yeah, like, Vince yeah. would have never done that. <laughs> So now that you're you're on the end of this journey in Code Red, Code Red's coming out now. That today is the release day. Um, that's when this episode's going to drop. Um, now that Code Red is your final book, um, what has the Vince Flynn like legacy um, combined with your books meant to meant to you? You know, the great thing about doing these books is I had written a lot of books of my own. I actually wrote some for Robert Ludlum. Um, I learned a lot. You know, I mean, I learned a lot from Vince, how he structured books, how he wrote action sequences, how he created characters. Um, but I also have learned a lot from fans because I took this over like 10 years ago and you know, social media and stuff wasn't quite as big back then. It certainly wasn't through my early career. It didn't exist. The, I started before the internet. And um, that feedback and dialogue and the friendships with the fans has been huge for me because you do, you know, do people like it? Do people not like it? You know, a lot of times people they'll throw all kinds of crazy stuff out that they don't like, but sometimes there's a consensus. Yeah. And, you know, like a hundred people tell you they don't like something. Yeah. They're probably right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that kind of stuff didn't exist before really before I, I signed on with the Vince Flynn stuff. You know, you might get a letter, yeah. like a handwritten letter every now and then, but people didn't have 
there's no way to interact interact with your readers realistically. Yeah. Go on TV or something, but it was always one way. Now you've got this great two-way dialogue with all these huge thriller fans who read not just Vinny, but um, you know Brad Thor and like Tom Clancy and like uh, tons of stuff. Mm -hmm. So they're really knowledgeable about what's going on in the thriller world, what's good, what's bad. So that's been my favorite part of doing this. Does that change the way you approach the next book? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I, I a, a person who owns a, I should probably not name her, but owns a, a big famous bookstore once told me, I think you wrote your books for yourself and you write Vince's books for his fans. And to some extent that was true, but again, part of it is because there was no feedback. Mm -hmm. So I would pick a subject matter I was interested in. I'd tell a story and I'd said, that's a book I'd want to read as a thriller author, but I wasn't ever sure if anybody else would, if it was just me. Right. Yeah. And now, you now to some extent, you know, people tell you, you know, what they're passionate about. So yeah, as I move away from Vince and I start back into writing my own stuff, that's a lesson that I've really taken away is what, what are people passionate about? What do people want like to read about? What kind of characters are they drawn to? And uh, I think that's been that's been huge for me over the last ten years because it's not something I thought that much about, strangely, before. So let's talk about Code Red, and then we're going to talk about kind of what's in store for the future. Um, Code Red, when you when it was announced, this is the last book by Kyle Mills. What was your feeling when that decision was made by you? That's hard. You know, that was a hard decision to make, you know, like quitting the best job in the world. You know, it kind of seems really stupid. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I'd sit there and I'd tell I, my wife, I was like, am I just the stupid, like, I, how can I be doing this? Um, so it was super hard. And then, you know, I, you know, I called and said, I don't really want to do, I'm not going to do it anymore. And then, of course, they, you know, they're really gracious. They're like, you know, why? What, what can we do for you? Why are you not happy? And it wasn't anything that was fixable. Like it wasn't that I didn't love working for my, with my editor. It wasn't like his agent. I didn't love his fans. I loved the character. And they're kind of, I think they were kind of like, what are you, an idiot? I mean, so everything's great. You're quitting because of that. And, uh, but, you know, it was time... I think it was time for me to go out and do something different. And I think also, you know, one of the benefits, if you can get authors that are passionate about it, like I am and Don is that are passionate about the series is get another perspective. You know, Don's younger than me. He has in a different part in his career. He has a different background than I do. And I think, you know, he's going to bring something new and fresh to the series. And I mean, kind of, I guess if there's a benefit to having a series that sadly the original creator passed away, it's that you do get it kind of turns over a little bit every now and then you get a little bit of a fresh perspective. So I'm excited about it. I mean, you know, I haven't been a, been a Vince Flynn fan for a decade now because I have to write the books, you know, but now I get a like the book gets released and I got to like order it and read it like I used to, which, you know, I loved doing. So it'll be kind of fun to see what's, what he's going to do with it. I can't decide if I want to, you know, beat him up while we're on tour and get, figure out where he's going or just like have it be a complete surprise. So, um, funny story. When we were at BoucherCon last year in Minneapolis and we were sitting around the bars, me, you, Todd Wilkins from best thriller books. I think it was Eric Bishop, a couple other people. And, um, when the announcement was made, I, I texted Todd and I was like, I cannot believe this. Can you believe this? He was like, duh, dude. He dropped the hint to us at the bar at BoucherCon. I was like, no, he didn't. No, Did he I? Didn't. You said something about wanting to explore your old Fade books and some of those yeah. characters. And 
I just heard it like, oh, that's cool. Like, maybe he's got a side endeavor. He's going to do that as well. And Todd was like, no, dude. He he hinted at it, and you just didn't catch it. And I was like, well, I feel foolish now. Like, <laughs> it was right there in front of me. And then he heard it, and I didn't. But um, – I, thought that I was, was probably funny. still wrestling with it because, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you like I said, best job in the world. And then you can think about leaving them for a long time. But, you know, once yeah. you say it, you've taken your finger off the yeah. piece, you know, yeah. you're, you're done. And uh, phew, that was a hard phone call to make. You know? Oh, I'm sure it was. And how did you feel when uh, Don was announced? Like, what was the excitement like for you? That was really great, and it, I, but it was so funny because they asked me, well, who do you think would be who, a good person to replace you? You know, like, give us a, because they were trying to find somebody and um, they finally said, well, we, we, we thought, well, why don't we ask you? And I had, like, I didn't even say Don because he was doing so well with the Clancy stuff. Like, I think he just debuted at number two or something on the New York Times list. I figured there was no way he'd be interested. And so the funny thing is he and I were having dinner and it had not been announced that I was leaving. So, and so I was sitting there talking about the, you know, the series kind of like I was going to continue it and he was talking about it. So I had no idea, but they had asked him to, to, re to replace me at this point at this dinner. Oh, wow. So, he went home and called his agent. He's like, oh my God, they're firing Kyle. And they haven't even told him. Oh. And so I, we were all lying to each other the whole night. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> and then later, so his agent's like, well, I'm going to call them. And they said, no, Kyle decided he wanted to leave. He can have the job as long as he wants it. And uh, <laughs> so Don called me and he's like, I can't believe it. We, we were sat there that whole dinner and just lied to each other, which is exactly what we were doing. It was funny. Could you imagine like his heart, like beating out of his chest when he kind of realized in that moment, like what was potentially happening and he's sitting across from you. Like I would have passed out. He I was had... not, he was clearly having an uncomfortable night. I felt really bad about it. Yeah. But, like they're throwing me out, out the window and uh, replacing me. <laughs> So what was, uh, what was it like developing Code Red, knowing that this was the last hurrah? Yeah, that was kind of a funny one because it's sort of like, what do you do with it? You know, you, I decided that I wanted to kind of do an old school Mitch Rapp sort of standalone, that it was going to be very much dialed in on that character, mm -hmm. um, really action-oriented, um, and there's some stuff in there that's kind of funny because I sort of felt compelled. This is obviously before I knew Don was going to take over uh, because Don's a huge fan of the series and he has an incredible memory for books he's read. Um, but I also wanted to establish everything in the book. So if the author didn't go back and read the whole series, the I wanted them to know who are the characters? What are their relationships? You know, like literally what is his name, Mitch's neighborhood look like? What's the history of the history of him and the CIA? And so all of that is interspersed in that book um, because I wanted to create sort of this nice level empty platform that the next author could say, this is the direction of the next 10 books. Like this is the arc I want to create without having a lot of baggage um, to deal with. And because I kind of ended up with a lot of baggage to deal with because obviously Vince was not expecting to pass away. So, so, so. yeah, so I had all these weird characters, strange relationships, I had a book that didn't really end, but he'd killed the antagonist. And so there was just a lot of stuff that needed to be dealt with. So, you know, I killed off some characters some kind of major characters and stuff that, and try to straighten the universe out in my mind. So like it was a completely nice universe that was puttering along in, in my head in a way that I understood. So hopefully Don's in a position where 
there are no loose ends really, unless he wants to dig back and find some that would be interesting, which is fun to do in this series. Um, and then he can kind of go in any direction he wants to. So Code Red compared to all the other ones you've written, is it, where does it kind of stand for you? Like as in how much you like best to worse? Yeah, I, like how does it stand in, in your kind of like your, your feeling about all your offerings? You know, it's really hard to say because I try to change up the way I write books, every book to be something different. It's, I don't think that would be apparent to a reader, mm -hmm. but to me it is. So there's something in every book that I wanted to accomplish that was different than the others. Um, to me, uh, I don't know, my greatest accomplishment was probably The Survivor because of really mimicking Vince's style, finishing that story that was really complicated and creating a book that nobody could figure out what part I wrote and what part Vince wrote, um, which is what I was going for. So that was, I mean, was it the best book I ever wrote in the series? Probably not, but it was certainly the hard, one of the hardest. Um, and Order to Kill, which was the follow-up, I have kind of a soft spot in my art for because I feel like it was kind of the perfect blend of what Vince did well and what I do well. Mm -hmm. um, and this book, yeah, man, I tell, it'd be hard to rate because it's, it's so bittersweet. You know, like my feelings of it were, ah, this is my last one, you know? I mean, it's kind of hard to get over that, that, you know, you finished it and I remember finishing the last second round of page proofs and thinking, now that's the last word I'm going to ever do in a Mitch Rapp novel. And yeah, it's kind of, kind of weird. You ever think about picking up a phone saying, Hey, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah. You know, I did actually, you know, you think, geez, what have I done? But you know, you, you can't, you can't fear change in life. You know, I used to be a banker and I said, I'm going to try writing a novel. You know, I mean, like you have to, you can't always play it safe. And, and I'm, I'm working on fade the sequel to fade now. And it is, it's really exciting because there are no expectations, you know, readers have no expectations that I can do anything I want with that character and with his universe. And the other some interesting thing about fans, it is, uh, weren't around. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Some of yeah. your new fans, like they don't know fade. Exactly. Exactly. The other interesting thing about starting a series now is that, you know, the Mitch Rapp universe has a lot of history to it. 20 odd years of history. So, you know, things like, I mean, to use an obvious example, COVID never happened in the rap verse. Mm -hmm. So now I can like start from day, like the day it's probably right. Right. I like all these things can have happened yeah. that have happened in real. So you're, you're starting with a fresh, you know, you're getting a fresh start on it. Um, and so that's kind of an interesting thing to deal with because, you know, Fade wakes up with this coma from this coma that he's been in for a few years and he kind of looks at the world and says, wait a minute, let me get this straight. In the few years I've been gone, this is what's happened. Mm -hmm. And you, when you write that list, it's really funny yeah. to think, you know. <laughs> so what does, what does the future hold? What are some things you're working on? What are some things that you're kicking around? What is, what is the future for Kyle Mills look like? Mostly that, you know, I can only do one book a year, really. It's all yeah. I ever want to do. I can focus on one thing at a time. So right now I'm working on that fade book. Um, someday I got to find out if I can get a publisher for it. So that's something I got to do next. And, uh, yeah, pretty much, pretty much that. I'm I'm renovating a house right now, so that's an absolute nightmare. I was just dealing right right before we got on. I was dealing with ca catastrophes relating to that. Um, so hopefully my life will settle down a little bit. I'll find a publisher and have. I'm like in a I'm like in a Airbnb. I live in Airbnbs now. Like have to move every week. Um, so. Uh, my, my goal is to make my life calm down, really focus on fade. And, you know, I have a, 
you know, idea for many books, like an arc and, and where this is going to go. Sorry. I can't turn this phone off because my internet had gone down and I'm, I'm using it to, uh, for, for internet. So it works. Um, the, uh, and so that's kind of what I'm going to focus on here for the next, um, year or so, uh, which for me is plenty. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we're, we're doing some kitchen renovations right now. And we're just between looking at the price tag and looking at what all it takes and the timing and, I'm not trying to do too much before Thanksgiving because we do Thanksgiving here with our extended families. So I'm just kind of like, we have to either do it right now or we have to wait until January, you know, and it's like. Yeah, you don't want to be cooking your turkey over a campfire in the backyard. <laughs> yeah, like you know, here in Oklahoma, <laughs> it could be 85 degrees on Thanksgiving. It could be negative 10. Like you just, you can't predict that. I mean, every year the Farmer's Almanac says something and they're wrong. So you're just like. Don't, you've got to, like, I don't want to do it. You've got to expand your, you got to expand. I, uh, during COVID, I live in Wyoming and, uh, we decided we just weren't going to have dinners with friends indoors. So we did the whole winter on the, on the deck and the, with the deck furniture. I bought down pants. I didn't even know those existed. <laughs> <laughs> and we would just sit out there and pretend it wasn't snowing on us. <laughs> Uh, we did Thanksgiving. Like it was thought, snowing on us. Oh, wow. That mm -hmm. was funny. <laughs> well, Kyle, um, thanks for coming on. Before I let you go, congratulations on Code Red. I know the future is going to be awesome. I'm a huge fan, huge admirer. Um, where can people go to follow you and to stay caught up on things so when you have that next release and that big news, they can uh, be the first to find out? Yeah, so I'm at at Kyle Mills author. So at Kyle Mills author, and that's like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, which I guess is X now. Mm -hmm. um, and then KyleMills.com, my website. You can sign up for my newsletter. I shoot a newsletter out once a month and uh, do blogs and stuff. So, um, and you can shoot me an email off my website too. I, I answer all my emails it's myself. So uh, if you ever want to complain or Better yet, tell me what a great author I am. That would be lovely. <laughs> fire away. <laughs> yeah, fire away. Well, Kyle, thanks again for carving out the time. I appreciate it. Congratulations on Code Red. Congratulations on the future. And hopefully I'll see you again soon. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. I'm not going to make Bautricon this year, but hopefully next year. Okay. All right. Talk to you later.